You're listening to Cotton Tails Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film A Place at the Table about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley, featuring African-American professionals, entrepreneurs, technologists, and engineers from the past and present. Today, we're talking to Tony Robinson, formerly a certified public accountant, a controller for several large banking firms, and now a registered financial advisor and author of the Book of Wisdom for Children. So, Tony, how's it going with the book? Book is done. Book is done. I got it in. Okay. And uh, now I'm working on the ebook. Oh. Got the best ebook version. Wonderful. And uh, yes, and then I, I have a uh, I have someone working with me to get my web my website together. Uh huh. Website is almost done. Uh huh. So then we will then proceed to uh, with the marketing program to put the book out there. So we're we'll moving right along. I'm telling you. <laughs> so I understand that uh, you came here from Panama. Yeah. Can you tell us about Panama? Okay, so I I was born in Panama um, on the Panama Canal Zone. And the Panama Canal Zone was uh, the area, um, I think, was uh, a few miles on both sides of the canal that the American government had, had control of. The American government and the military had control of. And... Uh, so the Panamanian government did not have sovereignty over that area. My father worked for the army. He did a lot. He was a jack of all trades, did all kinds of different things. But uh, the last job he did was to be uh, bring. Uh, he was he was a uh, facilitator. He, he uh, un, unpacked the GIs when they came in to uh, to live on the canal zone, and then he packed them up when they were going back to stateside. And so uh, he, he, that gave us a lot of little extra because uh, the communication with Americans, uh, Americans always had a little bit more. So we got a little bit more. You know, just that, uh, the crumbs that fell from the, from the U.S. table. And so uh, all my years growing up, I, I decided that uh, when I got older, I was coming to the United States. So I said I was going to get rich. I was going to get rich. I'm going to uh, come to the United States to get my share. <laughs> all, 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 all that money up there, I'm gonna get my chair. So I came up, uh, I came up, and I went to school. I went. My daughter lives in Michigan, and I went to Lansing, Michigan, and went to uh, community college in Michigan. I was a foreign student, and uh, so the tuition was thirty-one dollars an hour, uh, thirty-one dollars a unit. And let me tell you, that was not easy. Um, back in that time, in that, that was in 1973. 1973, $31 a unit. And I had to be full time because I was a full time student. But, you know, God always opens a way for us, so He opened up a way where I could get tutor on campus. I couldn't work off campus, so I had to work on campus. And uh, so God opened the way there, and I was able to uh, pay my tuition and, and so on. So I finished there. And then I caught the first first thing smoking out of out of Michigan. I was done because I come from a country where it, it is tropical, it is hot. And then you go to live in Michigan, where the refrigerators of the world are, and <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, the windmill where the wind is uh, is uh, generated. And it, you know, I, I said I I'm going to stay here as long as I need until I get all my papers fixed, I became a firm permanent resident. I got out of Michigan, came out to the United to uh, California, and uh, went to California State University and finished my degree in accounting. Worked for KPMG for uh, uh, two and a half years, long enough to get the CPA certificate to put up on my wall. I was done with that because I didn't want to work overtime for the rest of my life. So I got out of there and I went into banking. And most of my positions in my career has been on the controller, uh, as a controller in different companies and banks that I've worked in, and construction companies also. So I did that for a while until uh, till about 2012. Uh, 
Uh, I had a bout with cancer, been through that. But after that, you know, things were not the same. And uh, so I left corporate America, started working in insurance, worked with Aflac for a couple of years, learned the business, and then started branching out into other areas of insurance. And then in, in 2017, I met a young man who said, you know, you need to get, you're leaving money on the table. You need to get a license, a CV7 license and a, and a CV66 license. So that way you can, you can be an investment in the site. And I said, oh, he said, I, I told him, I, I heard that was a very difficult profession to be in. And, and I mean, a difficult test to pass. But everybody that I talked to said it was so difficult. He said, oh, no, I did it in six weeks. I said, six weeks. I said, okay. Just tell me what you did. Tell me what he did. In the six weeks, I had my three, seven uh, certificate. And then, um, then he said, okay, another three weeks, and you'll get the three, six, 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 and that'll allow you to, do, to, to have all investments of every kind. I said, okay, three weeks. Got on, went online, three weeks, buckled down, got that done. So within a nine, nine, uh, nine week period, got both of those certificates that everybody told me was taking years to do. So, I started doing that. So, I worked with a uh, uh, quick planning group. And we worked together. I'm, I'm an independent consultant, independent advisor. But we work together as a group. We share information and so on. So, that's what I do now. I also um, uh, am building a uh, network marketing business where we are uh, educating people about how to be in business for themselves. I came to realize that. Uh, you know, we've learned only, only one way to make money, and that's to get, a, get an education, get a good job, work real hard, and we want to be successful. That's what we've learned all our lives. <laughs> but I learned that uh, a job is the lowest form of making money. Uh, the way to make money, the other way, you stuff in the business or investing. And so we uh, started to, to do that with, with putting a business together. Our goal is to put together an army of young millennials like that that are entrepreneurs. And so when you are an entrepreneur, you have more to fight for. When you're an entrepreneur, you get more involved because it's not just about just getting the basics. It's about, you know, preserving your legacy and your future and the future of your children and your generation. So the goal is to be able to fail that to the point where we no longer have to work for money, but money will continue to work for us and then we can pursue the passions and the dreams and the goals that we have. Uh, another, I'm, a, I'm also a minister, A-M-E, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, I, um, my goal, my lifetime goal, is to bring a million souls into the kingdom. That's my, that's the ultimate. And so, for the rest of my life, that's what I'll be doing. But in the meantime, uh, we, are, we are doing what we're doing, we're trying to help people, we want, we want, we want our legacy to be that when we leave here, the more people better off because we are here. So what I what I'm hearing is you took your accounting skill. You 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 learned about money from the yeah. bottom from the ground up. Okay. So if um say if I were a young person, what would and I have a job say making mm -hmm. eighty two thousand five hundred a year. <laughs> so. <Okay. laughs> Um, what would be your advice to me and on how to begin to free myself from um, financial issues or you know problems? The first, the first thing I would say is uh, redeem your free time. You know, everybody says, "Oh, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy." Well, that's not necessarily true. If you sat down and you you, you did a diagram. Of the hours of the day, you put a, you put the days of the week across the top, and you put the hours of the day down the side, and you mark off every hour that was absolutely necessary for you to do. And I'm not talking about things that you can delegate. I'm talking about things that you have. You have to sleep for you. You have to eat for you. So if you went through the, that daily schedule and X out all those things that you have to do, you will find that there are a lot of things that you are doing that you do not have to do. So you take some of that spare time and you invest it in the future. The future does not fit constantly into the present. It never does. 
if you want to save money, all of a sudden the credit demands every penny that you that you have, and, and so you have to go to extremes to push yourself to save money. And it's the same thing with time. But anyway, you will get a hold of your time, and let's say that you are you have about say ten hours a week, say ten to twelve hours a week to invest in your future. I would be the first thing because everybody tells me that they're busy. They're busy watching TV, they're busy on the phone, they're busy on the computer. They're wasting time. So you've got to redeem the time. Secondly, you need a mentor. Somebody who is in life where you want to be. Somebody who has gotten there without having to lean on an employer or somebody else. Somebody who has the mindset to teach you so that you can, on your own, use your own initiative and your own creativity to put into an enterprise of your own. You need a part-time business, period. No way around. Everybody wants to get second job. That second job that keeps you pretty. But, but if, you, if you invest that time, you get the, you, you invest the time and you get the knowledge, the, the mentorship that, that teaches you, now we can start to put something together that's going to, that's going to pay you an honorable thing. Now, the other thing is this. The rich build next. Mm-hmm. The rich build next. Zuckerberg is a billionaire because he has a net. Uh, uh, Bill Gates is a, is a billionaire because he has a, he has a network of clients that use this program. He has a network of, of companies that, that, he, that he owns. Net, uh, Buffett has a network of companies. When it goes, the, 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 your productivity goes beyond your effort, that's when it goes. So, for example, a person who is uh, in a real estate, a person in real estate doesn't get rich necessarily unless they do. If a person is a, is a, is a real estate agent, they can sell five houses and make 100000 No problem. But if you want to be wealthy in real estate, you get 10 agents and you support them and you teach them everything. You leverage your knowledge and you invest that knowledge in those people, and you support them and you help them, and they sell 10 houses. And every time they sell a house, you make a little bit of money. Now you get rich. Because now you're making money, not on just your effort, but on the effort of the people that you have helped. So you build your success on the success of other people. Ray Kroc did it with McDonald's. Colonel Sanders did it with with, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. They built the success on the success of other people. So I would teach them how to build, how to develop the, the, the model. For example, Uber did exactly that. Mm-hmm. The founders of Uber don't, they don't drive taxi cabs, but they had the biggest taxi cab company in the world. Why? Because they developed a system where the little guy could turn his liability, which is his automobile, into an, asset, an income producing asset. And as a result of that, he could make money. And every time he makes money, Uber makes a little flat. And then he did it with a thousand, and then he did it with a million. And all around the world, and it's a multi billion dollar company. Build your success and the success of other people. Say Paul Getty said, I prefer to have 1% of the effort of 100 people than 100% of my own. Well, there you go. That, well, networking definitely is the key, obviously. But if you have this 10 hours, what mm-hmm. what would you invest in that would create an income stream? What? You would have, well, what I would do, this is what my wife and I are doing. We are building a network marketing. Oh. That is the easiest way to get into network. Because the nature of the business is network. Yes. And so what you do is you find one that is well established and you get a mentor, somebody who's successful in that business, and you sit at his or her feet and let them teach you the mindset of an entrepreneur. Most people get into these types of business and never succeed because they don't sit long enough at the feet of their mentors to, get, to develop the mindset. If once you have the mindset, 
You can build a network, and then once you have the network and the money is rolling, you can build anything. That's true. But you must get the wind that comes from someone who has already seen. Most people don't want to do it. They want to make money. They want instant money, instant tea, instant coffee, instant everything. And so when they don't get instant, they quit. But the ones that say, okay, teach me. I'm willing to learn. Right. Those are the ones that build large networks and become more than that. Network, your network determines your network. Yeah. Your network depends, determines your network. Because the information for that, for that you need to become wealthy is in that group. Is in is there. The information is there, isn't it? Well, Tony, you talked about something else. You touched on it, and that was wisdom. Tell me a bit about how you feel about wisdom and who should become wise. Uh, when I was about 32, I was reading my Bible and I stumbled on the book of James, first chapter. If you should believe and not doubt and it will be given. I stopped right there. I got on my knees. I said, Lord, according to your word here, you say that if I lack wisdom, I should ask you. I should believe, when I ask you, I should believe that you're going to give me right away, and I should not die. So I'm asking you right now to give me wisdom in the name of Jesus. And I got up and then said, I am wise. And I said, I am wise just to, to flush away any doubt that would crawl into my mind. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, I've always believed that I am wise. Now, most people, when I ask them, uh, in church, I, I teach them it with and, and I and I say, how many of you believe you're wise? And, and, and nobody nobody raises their hand because you see, most people think that if you claim to be wise, you'll be arrogant. But that's not true. That is not true. But if you think that way, then you you will always deny the wisdom that you have. I said, now how many of you have ever asked God for wisdom? Everybody raised their hand. So I said, now you have violated that scripture. If you ask God to wisdom, you, you should have believed that he gave it you right away and then not doubt. But you're telling me now that you are doubting what you asked for. So I said, I'm not going to be that. I'm, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be wise. And so as a, as, as a result of that prayer, I, get, I got a thirst for wisdom. So everything having to do with wisdom, anything, any wise thing anybody said, I was listening. And... Uh, and then I attended a seminar, and uh, in this seminar, the speaker said, you know, she was a father of the of the Army, and, and so the father always talked in character-building principles. And she talked about principles. And she said, anything can be learned if you learn the principles by which it functions. I said, oh, so that means that if I learn the principles of wisdom, I'll be wise. And this character-building concept often to go to wisdom. And okay, so I want to learn these, and when I have my children, as soon as they can see, I'm teaching it to them. So we, I, start, I started out with that thought, and I started reading and learning things to go wisdom, and then we, we had twin girls, and the girls got here, they got here, I was 38 when we got here, I, I started my own journey at 32, 38 girls got here, by about 41, about three years later, I, I heard my girls, he, the, the, uh, the Lion King was the, the, big, uh, the big show for the children. And the children had once watched it out of 40 times, I don't know. But I listened to them as they were saying verbatim every word that the character said. And I said, oh, it's ah. So then I, I had 10 principles I started to teach them. And I started just using a call and repeat situation. You know, I say, wisdom is knowing what to do, and they repeat it, doing when it's supposed to do it, and knowing what not to do, and not doing it. And so back and forth, they would go. Every night, they wanted me to read them a story. So before I read them a story, we did call and repeat with the principal. And so at the age of three and four, they knew what was wisdom, they knew what was knowledge, understanding, transparency, persistence, perseverance, these kinds of words. Now, they, they could about them like little parrots, but they didn't know what they meant. Yes. But as they grew, we started to connect the principles to life. Now, you see that? What principle is, 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 is at work here? Oh, yes, that was the principle of persistence. Okay. 
always just so, so that we're vibing. So as we as we spent time together, I drive around in the car, I had nothing to do. There were captive audience where I drilled them. And back and forth and back and forth. And I and my objective is for them to, uh, to embrace wisdom as their way of life. And I'm happy to say that they have done exactly that. And my wife said, okay, what well, you support the principles in the book. I said, oh, well, I'm talking about that. Yeah, well, you can self-publish the book. So I self-publish the book. Uh, and I went to the book and publishers and they said, oh, man, you can't just do 10 pages. We need, we need a, we need a hundred pages. So I said, okay, what I, I did is I put a principle on each page. And the idea, the, the idea was that the books were supposed to be such that they could tear out the page. Once the principle was mastered, the, the pages were the form of the, um, of the, of the certificate. And so when it, when it, when it simply mastered the principle, then they would, then the parent would sign it and put it up on the wall. Because the idea is to make wisdom so important in the, in the household that the children would learn to cherish it as, as part of their thing. I didn't do all the things that I said I was going to do, <laughs> do, but the concept stuck. And now my girls are you know, going to be 28 this year. And if you sit down and talk to them, you'll see the results of that. Yeah, wow, really. They are beyond their years, I'm sure. <laughs> beyond their, well, but because they, you know, they started at a very young age, and and accepted that they had nothing to compare it with, so they accepted at whole. How lucky for them! How lucky for them! I believe that the parents parents have a window of about five years yes. where they can really instill the thinking and the principles and so on in the children. And as the children grow now, they have a filter. Without the words, they don't have a filter. Right. But if they have these principles in their minds, then when they are supposed to make judgment calls, they have a filter. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So I'm sure you wanted to share this skill of yours with the world. So you wrote a book. And it is gonna have you're gonna be marketing that book. So, what is your network around this book? What skills have you brought from your other life to make this book a success? Okay, first of all, the new book is a child's guide to wisdom. Okay, child's guide to wisdom. And uh, one of the things that I learned, readers are readers. So I first started, they said, you know, you need to read 15 minutes out of the positive mental attitude book every day. It should be like a like a multivitamin to pop in your mouth every month with me. Because it helps you to develop the right mindset. I said when I graduated from college, I said, when I when I graduate from college, I'm not reading another book. Yeah, I'm not reading any more books. I'm tired of reading. And so my mentor said, uh, um, you, you need to start reading 15 minutes every day out of positive mental attitude. So I said, I, I, I told him, well, I'm not reading any of my books. He said, well, you want to make this money, right? So you know, you got to read. I said, okay, give me the book. So, so I, I started reading. A, a lot of the wisdom that I got from the book influenced the putting together of this book. Because again, there's a book that I read included principles of success and principles of wisdom that that everybody needed to have in order to succeed. So the words that are in here are words that I've gleaned from all the reading that I've done in trying to book my other business. So you pulled from all of your life experience. I'm one of I'm one of eight children. And uh, my my I, I was raised in a very strict home. Uh, of course, my father was a minister, and so he had five boys. And I learned that uh, when you put two boys together, the stupid factor increases exponentially. So <laughs> when you when you, when you have five, you got a problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my father was uh, was, a, was a very strict disciplinarian and so on. So uh, the, the problem down part of that, the downside of that is that you don't build a lot of emotional connections with the children if you're always a disciplinarian. Now, he was a good man, and I respected him for his relationship with, for his faithfulness to my mother, and 
he, he was a provider and all those things. I mean, he was a, he was a good, strong Christian. But I said, I, I won't do that like my father in terms of the relationship building. Yes. And uh, I swore up and down that my children would never say that their daddy never told them that he left. And so to this day, every time I see my children, I'm always hugging them and I'm always telling them that I love them. And so we have my, I'm a hundred and eighty degrees different from my father. Okay. So uh, I learned that, that, and the other thing is, raising our children was one of the most difficult things that my wife and I have done. Because we both come from different backgrounds. And as a result, you know, I've seen one way to do it, and she's seen another way to do it, and bringing the two together was not easy. Having the principle allowed us to be able to correct and instruct. Because we could always ask them about the principle, and then ask them if they were applying the principle or if they were violating the principle. It was a beautiful thing. You had a, you had a, a built-in guardrail from ba for bad behavior from the time that they were little girls because you'd already given them this this whole set of uh rules then they they have to take responsibility for everything that's amazing and that is the hardest thing for a parent to do is for that child to take responsibility well tony if you could go back to Panama and talk to a young Tony Robinson, what would you tell him? How would you advise him? Growing up, you know, some people, some people say, my parents always told me, you can do anything. You can do anything. Well, my parents didn't tell me that. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they didn't, want, they didn't believe that. It's just... They just never, they never, they never heard those kinds of things for themselves. Their parents, they were just regular people. They, were, they didn't get that level of wisdom. And so, you know, a lot of people who are able to achieve in the United States, they, say, they always said, my parents always told me you can do anything. Well, that's where I would start. I would tell that boy, you can achieve anything. Anything, anything that you desire, you can achieve. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take the restrictions off your mind. And I want you to dream. Think of the biggest thing that you would like to achieve. Once you've dreamed it, I want you to write it down. Say, this is what I am going to do. Make up your mind. And once you've made up your mind that this is what you're going to do, then God will give you, He will send you the people to give you the pieces to put together so that you can achieve whatever it is. Because the big vision comes from God. It doesn't come from you, it comes from God. So if you can dream big and embrace that vision, not say to yourself, oh, I don't know, I can't do this, I can't do that. You stop looking at what you can't do and focus on what you can do. Anything is possible. God will give you what you need. I absolutely agree, and that is why I met your wife in Hawaii, so that I would have a chance to talk with you. That's fabulous, Tony. Thank you so much for this interview. I appreciate your time, and uh, I, uh, you know, I'm hoping that. Uh, you have an incredible success with your book. I think it is something that's sorely needed. Are there instructions to parents to tell them to start this book at a certain age and how to talk with their child going forward when they go through this book? Are you giving those kinds of instructions along with the book? They are in the book. I have a section how to use this book. Oh, good. Thank you, Tony, for your insight and for sharing your story. And thank you for listening.